Wallach on Law examines criminal cases and criminal justice and asks the question, we are tough on crime, but is that helping? Can we be smarter and make us safer? You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Ian Wallach is a criminal defense attorney and civil rights lawyer in Los Angeles and New York. Whose cases have ranged from defense of the accused to prosecution of governments in their treatment of convicts. He's a former Los Angeles deputy public defender and a frequent contributor on legal issues to radio and television shows nationwide. You're out of order. You're out of order. The whole trial is out of order. We don't need a bigger post. This country, our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. This is Wallach on Law. Here's your host, Ian Wallach. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us again here on Wallach on Law for a very special episode. We're right around the corner of July 13th, and July 13th will mark the one-year anniversary of the verdict in the highly publicized uh, George Zimmerman trial. George Zimmerman was charged and acquitted of the murder of Trayvon Martin, and we're going to be discussing that trial uh, with Don West. Now, Mr. West, along with Mark uh, Mark Amara, were George Zimmerman's attorneys, and Don West was kind enough to join us today. Don West is a dedicated trial attorney. His uh, career has largely been spent uh, protecting the indigent community. Those are individuals who get court-appointed counsel. They're not able to uh, afford their own counsel. He's the former senior litigation counsel for the Federal Defender's Office, a criminal trial specialist, and he's represented people charged with all nature of offenses. Uh, He's a fellow member of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and among the National Trial Lawyers' top 100 lawyers. Uh, Don, welcome to the show. Don, are you here? Hey, Ryan, I think we uh, we don't have Don on the line. Don, are you here? I'm here. Oh, hi, Don. Great. Oh, Thank good. you so yes. much. Uh-huh. There we go. It, it, it fixed. Thank, thanks so much. First of all, thanks for joining. Thanks for taking your time. Of course. I, I you're welcome. It's, it's a pleasure. And I imagine it's, uh, it's quite a busy time for you. Now, this, this trial uh, sparked a lot of dialogue uh, among the public. It attracted a tremendous amount of attention. And it got people talking about things that I think people hadn't talked about before, things like the Stand Your Ground laws or, uh, or the Castle doctrines. Uh, for those people who are listening who, who aren't lawyers, could, could you explain what those doctrines are and, and how, if at all, they played into the Zimmerman trial? Sure, I'd be happy to. Essentially, the Castle doctrine, Stand Your Ground, are various aspects of self-defense. Stand Your Ground and the Castle doctrine are largely the same principle, in that when one is confronted with a potentially violent situation and you are imminently in fear of death or great bodily harm, you have the right to defend yourself up to and including deadly force. However, traditionally, you have to retreat first. You have to escape, flee if you can, and only if you're unable to do that may you then use that deadly force. The Castle Doctrine over the years protects people from having to flee if they are in their own home. Stand Your Ground essentially extended the Castle Doctrine to any place, at least in Florida, where you have the lawful right to be. So in other words, if you are attacked and faced with a situation where you may be seriously injured or killed, you actually have the choice under Stand Your Ground. You may flee but you don't have to. You may meet force with force, essentially standing your ground. And uh, now, Out here in California, that, that's built into our, the jury instructions for our self-defense law. That, mm-hmm. Is there a separate type of me- – I understand there's a separate mechanism in, in Florida, uh, a procedural mechanism to, to assert stand your ground. Is that correct? Or I might be wrong. but There's a separate aspect of stand your ground where – one accused of um, a violent crime may pre-trial file a motion asserting that the conduct was in self-defense. It doesn't actually have to be based upon standing your ground, but in self-defense, claiming that they had the right to defend themselves under those circumstances after presenting evidence at a pre-trial proceeding, if the judge believes in this instance that the accused has established the claim by a preponderance of the evidence, then the court may at that point dismiss the case. And, the, and that's uh, a decision that's, that's made by a bench officer, by a judge. That's not a jury-based decision. That's right. However, if the judge disagrees and denies dismissing the case, you still have all of the protections in a jury trial, which essentially okay. shifts the burden of proof then to the prosecutor. 
Now, did that come into play in the Zimmerman trial? We wrestled with filing a pretrial stand your ground hearing. We, in fact, uh, had drafted the motion. We had a date for it, and we elected to withdraw that. We chose not to go forward with the judge on a separate pretrial stand your ground proceeding. That's, that's right. A uh, couple of reasons for it. One, we would have had the burden of proof. Another is we would have then been faced with the situation of presenting evidence that would then have been subject to cross-examination, perhaps then been admissible in the trial, including a decision whether Mr. Zimmerman testified. Sure, and, because uh, I take it anything that he uh, anything he says at that hearing could be introduced then uh, at, at trial? Absolutely, and it's happened. Uh, it happens routinely here in Florida. And, of course, frankly, I was concerned as we talked about the strategy behind this. We felt under the circumstances and given the history of the case procedurally, we didn't have a lot of – we didn't have a high probability with, sure. uh, with our judge under these circumstances. And, frankly, and Mark and I talked about it with the rest of the team. We thought the last thing we need going into a jury trial – uh, with this much public attention is the judge having denied our motion. That would be misconstrued. The media would run with it. The public would say, hey, the judge doesn't think it's self-defense. And then we have another hill to climb. We just weren't willing and to it would, that it risk. would potentially send a message to a potential jury pool of, of, of what a judge thought was correct. Oh, my goodness. You know, the jury summons had already been issued. People were paying specific attention, especially those that lived in Seminole County, because they knew they had a high probability of being on the jury. Sure. So sure. Yeah. Can you can you walk me just through, in, in, in you know, easy terms, the, the life of this the life of this case, just what happened on the night, what the initial investigation showed, and, and what a special prosecutor is and what their involvement was? Are you, you want me to run through the basic facts, the basic Just the uh, basic facts. I mean, I'm sure it would take hours, but yeah, yes. Yeah. What led yeah. to the appointment of a special prosecutor? What is a special prosecutor? Factually, George Zimmerman was on his way to Target. He spotted a person later identified as Trayvon Martin, didn't recognize him, and in fact followed him as he was talking on the phone with the Sanford Police Department. At one point, while George Zimmerman was still on the phone, Trayvon Martin ran off, and George Zimmerman got out of the car while on the phone with the police to see if he could locate where he had run because he had requested a police officer respond to the scene. Some minutes passed, actually, as much as four minutes passed, and there was a confrontation between Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman that occurred right behind a residence in this uh, complex. Most of what happened after that was captured in the background of a 911 call, which was... Uh, uh, heard screaming, repeated screaming, and then the gunshot. Because the police were on their way, the police were there within less than a minute, and residents were there within seconds. But um, George Zimmerman was not officially arrested. He was taken into custody. He was actually detained for several hours while the police conducted their local investigation, which included an eyewitness who saw George Zimmerman on the bottom of this uh, two-person uh, fight and clearly identified Trayvon Martin as being on the top. So while George Zimmerman was at the police department um, cooperating, frankly, he was, he was giving statements and being photographed and such, the ground investigators were taking witness statements and processing the scene. Kind of fast-forwarding a little bit, uh, the decision was made to release Zimmerman that night and um, he lived in the community, had a, a permit for his weapon and such. And frankly, as we know as lawyers, that had he been arrested and triggered speedy trial, that would have accelerated the entire case by several months. However, because he was arrested, was not formally arrested and brought before the court, it created the public uh, controversy and, and ultimately resulting in public demonstrations and, and petitions and, and such. The special prosecutor was appointed, I think, under unusual circumstances in this case, in that there was no true conflict of interest that the local prosecutor had, but because of the circumstances and the outcry from at least certain parts of the public, it was a confusing kind of chaotic time, Governor Scott appointed a special prosecutor from another jurisdiction, probably just to uh, 
forego any concerns of bias or prejudice that was already being um, uh, leveled at the local state okay. attorney. So, so my Frankly, understanding is, is filing decisions are usually made, an officer you know, surveys a, an incident, makes a report, makes a filing recommendation, a filing deputy then goes ahead and files you know, an indictment or a complaint or whatever the charging document is. Uh, that, that didn't happen here, and the filing instrument was then commenced at the direction of the governor? No, the governor simply appointed the special prosecutor who then took over the investigation. There was a recommendation from the local police department to the state attorney's office. The original state attorney was going to convene a grand jury. The special prosecutor did not and made the decision to file second-degree murder charges on her own. She has that authority okay. in Florida, so there was no now, grand jury. Okay. Now, there's been a lot of discussion lately about transparency uh, in the law, and it's a big issue. Um, and, and for the non-lawyer, could, could you basically explain the prosecutorial duty uh, to disclose evidence? Sure. Under every state's rule of criminal procedure, as well as in the federal courts, the prosecutors have certain obligations. In addition to that, under United States Supreme Court case law, prosecutor must also disclose exculpatory evidence, evidence that might impeach a witness or in some way indicate that the accused was not guilty. Uh, transparency. Feel, I'm sorry. Do, go ahead. Do you, yeah, well, I just I wanted to know if you feel like like there was transparency in the Zimmerman trial. Do you, do you feel like the exculpatory evidence was quickly presented? We learned over a period of months that significant evidence was either withheld or very slow in being released. Some of it may have been um, unintentional, but we certainly got the impression as the months rolled on that there was a clear effort to obstruct, if not um, hide evidence. And, and it's, it's hard for me, and I certainly won't accuse them of conspiring to violate their obligation, but as one thing led to another, as statement after statement was made to the court that we've given them, given them everything, Judge, only Do you to have find any, Can, can you give me an example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just sort of a, an example of, of, of something that, 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 that laid you, made you have this concern, or at least have to go litigate this issue in a, in a pretrial motion. Oh, sure. We filed uh, four or five motions to compel uh, evidence over the course of, of the litigation. And then sometime in October, the prosecutor stood up in front of the judge and said, we have given them everything, Judge. They're, we've given them all the reports, only for us to learn five or six days later that there were 10 or 15 additional reports that the Florida Department of Law Enforcement had prepared that had not been provided. And I think very importantly, a number of reports that the FBI had prepared where they surveyed the community and coworkers asking specifically if George Zimmerman showed racial animus or there were incidents they were aware of where he was racially insensitive. And obviously that was a big issue in the case right from the beginning, even though it wasn't an element sure. of the case. It was very important for us to show that these wild sort of inflammatory statements early on that he was a racist and a murderer uh, were not supported by any evidence whatsoever. Had this stuff been released early on, I think it would have changed the whole way the case was viewed, frankly. Uh, yeah, viewed, viewed in the public. Was there an issue with a photograph or – in the first round of discovery, we had a photograph of George Zimmerman's face that was actually a photocopy that we got black and white. I asked the prosecutor for a better copy. I insisted on color. A couple of months later, we got a color picture, but it wasn't a photograph. It was a, J, um, a PDF file in color. Better, but still wasn't the original. And then I wound up writing a letter and then filing a motion to compel, and we actually had a hearing where we had to go in front of the judge and say, we want the JPEG file, we want the original photograph, and the prosecutor <laughs> had the audacity to say, Judge, I don't know what a JPEG is. And when we finally got it, it was photographic quality, and it was the one that showed the fairly dramatic injuries to uh, George Zimmerman's face. And I take it that was vastly different than what you had initially been provided. There had been a lot of talk early on when the original video from the police department was released that George Zimmerman wasn't injured and that, therefore, what he was saying was simply untrue. And then when we finally got this photo months later, 
it showed the blood on his face um, still glistening. It was completely different Amazing. imagery. It was powerful, in fact. Mm-hmm. Right, now, Don, um, this this promoted such a tremendous dialogue across the country that it went all the way up the ladder. It went uh, it went all the way to the President of the United States, who ultimately um, uh, made a statement uh, on the day of the verdict. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to play one portion of that statement and then and then get your comments on it. Is, is that okay? Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, yeah, so yeah, go ahead and play that, can't we? I know that there's been commentary about the fact that uh, the stand your ground laws in Florida were not used as a defense in the case. Uh, on the other hand, if we're sending a message as a society in our communities that um, someone who is armed potentially has the right to uh, use those firearms, uh, even if there's a way for them to exit uh, from a situation, uh, is that really going to be contributing to the kind of peace and security and order that we'd like to see? And for those who uh, who resist that idea that we should think about something like these stand-your-ground laws, uh, I just ask people to consider, if Trayvon Martin was of age and armed, could he have stood his ground on that sidewalk? I, and do we actually think that... I, I'd love to get your input because that's a, that's a profound statement. It's not directly related to your work, but I'd love to get your comments on that. It's not completely clear what the president's point is there because as soon as George Zimmerman or Trayvon Martin is invoked in any kind of conversation, I think it becomes polarizing. And to suggest right at that point that that's a good case for us to begin the discussion on stand your ground or firearms control, I think is problematic. I I have to think, though, that if the president is suggesting that under circumstances similar to what we know about the George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin case, that Trayvon Martin would have had the right to shoot George Zimmerman merely because George Zimmerman was following him and he felt scared, is as a trial lawyer, I'm very troubled by that because little facts make for outcomes in big cases, and um, that doesn't help me resolve the issue at all, unfortunately. Sure. sure. Now, you you got faced with a with a last minute change up in that trial. I mean, uh, an out of the blue last minute allegation or, or a change. It was a, a child abuse felony murder uh, allegation. Right. right. Did, uh-huh. Were you were you expecting that? Did that come out of nowhere? It came out of nowhere, although I wish we had seen it coming because it was obviously something that had been planned for some time. As we looked back on the charging document, Trayvon Martin was identified as a minor, as a 17-year-old. And not until the charge conference, maybe an hour before it started, the prosecutor suggested this lesser included of felony murder based on child abuse, and I got it by email. I was handling the charge conference as uh, Mark was preparing for closing statements. And I didn't see it coming. I had no idea until I got into the courtroom and there was a stack of 10 or 15 cases that the state had copied in anticipation of making the argument to the judge. And this was pretty and, late uh, to the trial, I take it, right? Well, this was the morning of closing arguments. This was the charge conference. Closing arguments <laughs> were going to start as soon as we were done. It's reasonably hard to put a defense together in, in, in that amount of time. And the, the point, though, Ian, I was making, why it was a long time coming from the prosecutor's side, is it was keyed off language in the information that I didn't appreciate the significance of. No one did. So they'd been working on it for a year, and we had about an hour's notice. In fact, Less than an hour's notice. Uh, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. Now listen, you know I only have about a couple minutes left with you, uh, Don. I, I know that a large part of your work has been with the Federal Public Defender's Office. Uh, I, I do similar work uh, here in Los Angeles on the state on the state side, and, and I'm thankful that for you and, and for people who do that type of work. Uh, but there, there was a, a, an advertisement that's been promoted against a, a political candidate named Vince Vince Sheehan. And, and I want to play for it, play it for you, and just get your thoughts on it, if I may. Um, Ryan, can, can, can you play the, the the Republican Governors Association? It's a fact. Trial lawyer Vincent Shaheen made money off criminals. 
got a sex offender out of jail time, defended a child abuser, and represented others charged with violent acts, threatening to kill, punched in the face. Shaheen defended violent criminals who abused women and went to work setting them free. So next time Shaheen says he'll protect women from violent criminals, ask him, what about the ones who paid him? Vincent Shaheen protects criminals, not us. That's that's the ad. That's, that's the ad. Um, it's outrageously offensive, thoughts. isn't it? Yes. It's, it's, it, it's an insult to what the Constitution says every person accused of a crime has the right to, and that is a lawyer that will be committed to their cause, that will be sure they are treated fairly, regardless of what that charge is, that they have the opportunity to meet the force of the government with someone who serves in their best interest. Of course, the job does not mean that you align yourself factually or philosophically or in any way condone the acts of which your client is accused, but to stoop to that that level is astounding. I guess I shouldn't be surprised <laughs> how low politics seems to get sometimes. Still, that's, I was, that's shocking. That's I, shocking. I, I, I was pretty shocked with that, and, um, and I was glad to get your input on it. Uh, okay, well, Don, listen, um, thank you so much uh, for, taking, uh, for taking your time and, and for helping us have some, some insight on this uh, incredibly important trial and at this incredibly important time. Uh, really, thank you. Thank you so thank much you, for your Ian. time. It's a pleasure. And glad to have you back. Mm. Thank you. If you want to learn, thank you. And if you out there, you want to learn more about Don West. Uh, you know he's in Orlando, Florida. It's the DonWestLawGroup.com. Uh, it's an absolute honor uh, to have him here. Um, uh, I want to talk about a couple of different things uh, that are happening right now um, in, in the criminal context throughout the country. And I don't want to take away this next story I'm about to bring up. It rings of humor, but but really it is not. Uh, yesterday in the Washington Post, th- there was an article about a, Man- um, a Manassas, uh, Virginia teenager who was accused of sexting a video. He was 17 years old and apparently uh, sexted uh, a, 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 picture, a, a picture of his genitalia to uh, his, uh, a 15-year-old, and, and she may have done the, the same. And he was being charged for that in, in juvenile court, and his lawyer was apparently told of, of a warrant. And per the Washington Post, uh, which I would not believe this if it was not printed in the post, and it's just at this stage was the lawyer's allegation. That this warrant was to compel that this 17-year-old boy be arrested, be taken to a hospital, uh, and have his privates uh, in- injected to, and I'm not making this up, to simulate arousal so a photograph could be taken to be used as comparative evidence in, in the trial. Now, now that sounds... That sounds absolutely crazy. And, and when I heard that, I, I didn't know if a judge would actually do that. The Manassas uh, City Police released a statement saying doing that would be against our policy, but they didn't follow that up saying it's untrue and we didn't do it. So uh, I, I've never I've come off to the defense ranks. I'm, I'm a former public defender. The prosecution I've done has been international and in war crimes, and you don't get the opportunity to bluff. So I can't really understand what, what happened here. So I turned to my law partner, Jason Feldman. He was a DA for years. Uh, Jason, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you for having me. No, hey, brother. Thanks. Listen, um, just can you do you think this warrant I- exists, or could this be a bluff by the DA? Well, I mean, my first reaction to it was <clears throat> this has to be a bluff, but it looks like they've taken this bluff pretty far. Um, you know, the Washington Post reports that there is a magistrate that has seen an affidavit, but they didn't name the magistrate, and they didn't confirm how they knew that a magistrate had actually looked at it. I would think it would be pretty hard to find a magistrate that would sign this, but, you know, they brought this up in court twice, and also uh, a detective brought it up to this child's attorney. So if it is a bluff, which it, it seems like it has to be, because, I mean, how yeah, let me, let me can you? Let me just ask you about yeah. the bluff. I mean, is this something that a district attorney can do? They, can, they, can, they have the power to say to a juvenile, listen, you know, you can you can either go ahead and take this plea agreement right now, or we're going to continue our investigation. And included in this investigation is a absolutely uh, horrific and traumatic experience that you're going to be subjected to. Is that a bluff that 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 they can make without without any ramifications? Well, it isn't a bluff if you put it in terms of this is what can happen to you. This is what we have the power to do. This is what could happen which is what I'm sure they walked that line and said it to him, like, hey, you can enter a plea guilty, or we could get a warrant, and the following could happen. 
Now, I understand, just so I, I think I understand that, because the, the idea is, you know, whose is the image that's on the phone? And the argument, the question is, why do you need to have this happen? Why does it matter who's on the phone? But from what I understand correctly, it's the difference between a, a sexting issue, a, a sexting between, you know, 15-year-olds and 17-year-olds can constitute possession and transmission of, of child pornography. Is that pretty much the argument? Well, he's charged with two things. He's charged with possession of child pornography and manufacturing child pornography. Now, apparently his 15-year-old girlfriend had sent him some pictures, so that could be the possession. And so then he'd have to be charged with manufacturing and the, the um, you know, child pornography part, the child part, they have to prove that the genitalia that's depicted in the video is that of a minor's. And, I and don't so, even know in which case, it would be it would be his, which is why they would want the why they can legitimately threaten to make him undergo this experience. If he yeah, if he doesn't admit that it's his a penis, then uh, you know they'll have to prove that in court. And how would they prove that? It might be difficult. Um, but I don't know what this warrant will show either. I mean, they'll have two perhaps similar looking penises. I don't know how that gets them there either. Unbelievable. Uh, and I, I don't want to uh, thank you. Listen, thanks a lot for, for for coming on. I'm sure we can agree on one thing. I mean, theoretically, the the investigation of, of someone should should not subject them. I, I don't want to undermine the trauma of of anyone who's who's received unwantedly uh, a sexually explicit photograph. And I understand this complaint was initiated by the parent of someone, and and any parent would probably be deeply deeply disturbed. But it seems very very problematic that we might be willing to subject the accused to traumatic experiences that, that may greatly experience the, the, the exceed the trauma that, that potentially they, they, they inflicted. Right. It seems beyond ironic to, to create child pornography when you're prosecuting child pornography. But thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on, Ian. Hey, it, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, okay, listen, that's, uh, we're, we're, we're coming close to the end. I only got about, about a minute left. I, I do want to let you guys know we were covering the Wisconsin stabbing trial, this horrible trial. Really, where these uh, the the two 12-year-old girls lured uh, another uh, and stabbed her repeatedly uh, in jail. The the trial is continuing uh, on the adult track uh, as to one of the defendants. The other, uh, a judge on July 2nd, not a judge, a doctor declared her incompetent. Uh, if that if that declaration, if that doctor's opinion holds up, that's probably a good thing for for that defendant. It'll be taken out of the uh, adult context and put into the mental. Uh, health context. The other one looks like it's continuing in the adult context. And the fight over whether or not uh, it is an, uh, an adult crime or, or these 12-year-olds should be prosecuted at juveniles is ongoing. Uh, Brad Schimmel, he's the district attorney, states wants to wants to prosecute them in the adult court because he says, listen, if they're if they're in juvenile court, we only have them until we're 25 and, and then we're done. Uh, as opposed to if they're prosecuted in adult court, they could be they could be grown up for prison, raised for prison grow up in prison and, and not be released until the, the, they're 72. Uh, th th these are kids. I mean, I, I know what, what happened here is beyond a travesty, but, but giving up on children is a travesty as well. Raising children in prison for a life in prison is, is barbaric, and I, I have a hard time believing that, that preteens are beyond redemption. Um, the, the state of Wisconsin apparently does not. If this guy ever runs for office, just remember, I mean, his, his motto could be that, hey, vote for Brad Schimmel because some children belong in prison forever. Well, these are children, please. Just let's just never give up on kids. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, thank you for joining us. Special thanks to Don West. Special thanks for Jason Feldman for joining us. If you want to see what we do, check us out at renovatejustice.com or send me your thoughts at change at renovatejustice.com. Special thanks to Mark Goldman, Ryan McCormick, my producer here, Eliza Spada Burke. And uh, thanks, folks. And remember, let's keep using our heads. Let's stop using our hate. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>